Welcome to episode 245 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. In today's episode, I'm excited to introduce you to Evan Nesterak, Editor-in-Chief at Behavioral Scientist. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast, where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain-friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. In today's conversation, I'm joined by Evan Nesterak, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Behavioral Scientist, a nonprofit digital and print magazine that examines the world through the science of human behavior. Previously, Evan led the Mindset Assessment Project, an initiative designed to bring rigorous psychological research into the world of sport, and worked with Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania on character development research. This is such a fun conversation. And Evan shares some never before publicly discussed stories from his background and that of behavioral scientist and how it was born, which is always fun. Thanks for sharing that with us, Evan. We are going to get to hear all about his work and the focus at the magazine. It is an episode full of laughs and brainy goodness. Really quick, before we get into that conversation, I want to be sure you know that there are links in the show notes for everything, including related past episodes, links to articles and books, including Brain Meets World, which has been put out by Behavioral Scientist, and so much more. It's all within the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 245. Now let's jump right in. Evan Nesterak, welcome to the Brainy Business Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited that we're, I want to say finally doing this, though it's not that I asked you all that long ago. It's more just been in my brain to have you uh, be on the show for a long time. And so thank you for for joining me and getting together and being able to talk about behavioral science, because what's better than that, really? Hey. You've teed it up perfectly. I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, for everyone who doesn't yet know you and who you are, can you share a little bit about yourself and your background and the work that you do? Sure. So I'm the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Behavioral Scientist, uh, which is a digital and print uh, magazine focused on expert commentary on behavioral science. And what we really try and do is provide a platform for great behavioral science writing by established and emerging thinkers from all over the world. And we also try and support a a global community of readers who are really curious about human behavior. And we've been around for about five years. And before that, um, I was working on something called the Psych Report, which is a similar project, but uh, much smaller, much more of an MVP version. and I was doing that while I was doing all my other, all, all the other jobs I did. And th- those included, um, you know, doing research at Penn with Angela Duckworth. I also did some research with the U.S. Soccer Federation, um, where we uh, did a study looking at the mindsets of the elite youth players in the Development Academy. And we were connecting that to performance data. And before that, I was a soccer coach. And before that, I had a whole number of odd jobs from rodeo security guard for a couple of weeks in Denver to um, caretaker of a random farmhouse in a Czech village to uh, working in a, in a local organic canning company in Denver. So a, a winding path, but uh, those, those were only detours to, to, till I came back to psychology. Interesting. I have so many questions and thoughts that came from all of that, as I'm sure you can appreciate. So uh, first, which is going to be, you know, knowing that the content here is evergreen, but I feel like I have to ask about the World Cup because we're in the the midst of it and like looking at U.S. Uh, men's soccer making the round of 16. Any any thoughts on uh <laughs> World Cup? Yeah, well... Well, very excited as a fan. Um, very impressed to, to watch, um, all the teams at this year's World Cup. Um, my friend, uh, is a really, is a high level soccer coach. And so we're, 
where we've been talking about the games and he knows way more than I do about how the tactics have evolved since we were playing, you know, a little over a decade ago. And I'm just so impressed by how much how fit these guys are, how tactically adept they are. And I'm really looking forward to uh, facing off against the Netherlands. And so um, hopefully we can give them an early exit. Yes. Sorry to the, to your Dutch <laughs> listeners. <laughs> I know. I, and I know there are, there are many. So I can't say that we'll proudly wear orange if we lose, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know when the, they're going to play on, on Saturday. So we may cut this actually if, if my, if my predictions don't <laughs> no, come no, true. No, no, no. Well, no, this is going to come out after and it's going to be super weird and I love it. <laughs> that's fine. I'm totally down for that too. <laughs> so no, that's, uh, that's, that's great. I, I, of course, was thinking of, as you were talking about soccer, it made me think of Lighty Klotz, uh, who's been on the show before. I don't know if you've done any uh, work or talked with him much with his background in soccer, of course. There's actually a really funny... Lighty and I met in a really funny way, actually. I was living in Charlottesville when I was working on the soccer research project because I was my collaborators were um, professors at the Curry School of Education at UVA. And so I had moved to Charlottesville and was living there. And I was running that project and doing behavioral scientists in the early, early uh, couple of years. And Lighty emailed me um, and said hey, to pitch an article. And I noticed his email address. And I was like, UVA. And then I, I Googled him a little bit. And I was like, this is so strange. So I, we, we set up a time to meet. And it was supposed to be, you know, half 45 minutes or something. It's in his office. We ended up talking about everything and anything, um, including soccer and behavioral science for a good three hours in his office. And then after that, we've, we've, uh, um, been great sort of, um, when I was living there, we would, we would, we had a tradition of getting lunch at the Turkish restaurant downtown and talking ideas. And since I've, I've since moved from Charlottesville, but we still stay in, in close contact. And, uh, um, I always appreciate Lighty's work and I'm excited for, what he's going to do next. Yeah, for sure. Well, we'll definitely link to Lighty's episode here in the show notes for everyone to go learn about doing less <laughs> as that's, you know, subtracting and, and looking to, to do less and do better. I, I really love his work as well. And then you can go and also see why we're talking about what Lighty has to do with soccer because, and it's quite a bit and you'll be impressed. So there's really cool stuff there. And of course, Angela Duckworth and work on, on grit. And I, I'm assuming that is some of what you were working on and, and researching. Yeah. So when I was there, um, I was primarily working with a, a graduate student and we were really looking at deliberate practice and uh, the graduate student who's now a professor at UChicago, Lauren S. Price Winkler, she um, had designed these studies to one of the things we worked on that I, I thought was really interesting was these mentoring interventions. And she was trying to understand how giving advice versus receiving advice, being the mentor or the mentee position affects how you behave um, when you're given a challenging task later on. So she was running experiments um, to that effect. And so we were waking up early and going to middle schools and things like that to, to test that out. And, you know, one of the interesting things that we find um, often when you're in a, when you're newer to something, you often are put in automatically into the mentee role. Um, and so you're kind of getting talked to a lot, which is, which is good. You know, I was a coach, you know, there needs to be somebody um, helping you learn and helping you explain something, but it is powerful to have that, um, script flipped and be the uh, mentor, even if you're newer into something um, where you have enough experience where you can certainly um, add value. And so students were sharing ideas for younger students um, that might be new to high school or new to middle school. And that was a powerful frame for them. And actually, in her research showed, it did kind of increase uh, deliberate practice, if I'm remembering correctly, but that was at the, that was at the earlier iterations of it, and she's since published on it. So, if you're curious about that, I would, uh, or if any listeners are curious about that, I would say um, maybe we can put a link to to that paper, so you have the most up to date, most up to date stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe as you're talking about the project, 
So when Katie Milkman was on the show, I believe she talked about this research and it's included in my second book. Um, so perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> you got multiple link, more, more links to being. So I'm talking, I'm talking to, I'm preaching to the choir here basically. Um, but that was, that was a really fun project I did at, at character lab, or I guess at that point it was the Duckworth lab, which then became character lab and working for Angela was really, uh, that's when she was writing her, her book. And so, um, my brother was her, her research assistant on, on her book at that time. And so it was, a uh, it was, it was fun being in the lab, um, with, with my brother. Um, it was an exciting time to be studying all of these things. And one of the things that I, I reflect back on is that how I would say focused and humble Angela was at when we were doing the work. So, obviously extremely driven. You don't write a book on grit unless you're extremely driven. But at the same time, in discussions and and facing criticism and all of these things, just really, really just let's get to the bottom of it. Let's do it. Let's take action. Always really appreciate that. And so I've taken taken a lot of those lessons um, since I've left the lab. Um, I guess that was those were 20, 2016 and 17, I think was when I was there. So it's been a few years now. But great great relationship with Angela and the whole character lab crew. Very cool. Well, I think that, you know, for me, Angela Duckworth and, and grit, it's such a like top of the, the list. And I see that bear. So the behavioral science in action at Rotman is on the list of supporters of behavioral scientists. And so your episode is going to come out either the week after or two weeks after Dilip Soman's episode is coming out on the show. So it's like all the, overlaps. Now you see why I said like, this is a long overdue conversation. And I'm really excited to, um, to be connecting with you. So, so with all of that, so you have a degree in psychology. Um, sounds like your brother also, uh, maybe has a PhD if being in the research assistant side of things, or maybe not, I don't know what's the, and then behavioral scientists just like manifested one day, like, what's this story? How did this come about? What was the dream? Okay, so the history, the history of how it how it all started. That's a great question. Uh, because we're on a podcast, I'll go into a little bit more detail that that most people probably don't know. So it go all goes back to about 2008 <laughs> when I was when I, so I was doing my my senior thesis in undergraduate with Barry Schwartz, um, or just before I should say the summer, and I had spent the summer uh, with. Uh, former teammate of mine at Swarthmore College, who is now doing his PhD at Stanford in psychology. And I was trying to figure out, do I want to do a PhD? A lot of people are asked themselves that question at some point, and it leads to different, many different paths. So I was, I was no different. And then uh, I came to, in my senior year, I started doing a thesis with Barry Schwartz. And in all those conversations, I was just like a lot of people, why aren't, we applying um, a lot of these these ideas and this research. Why aren't we testing it in the real world? Um, you know, it's a little bit of naivete when you're when you're twenty something year old and you're you know you think you have the answer to all the problems. But at the same time, there was there was an itch that I needed to scratch that was outside of the lab, and I knew that I didn't want to go straight to do a PhD. It just wasn't it wasn't the fit for what I what I wanted to do. But at the same time, I didn't want to do much, I, I, at the same time, I loved psychology and I loved thinking about human behavior. And so what I decided to do instead um, after college, and this was a sort of unfolding decision to the, I'm sure I tested the patience of my parents a bit, but I decided to do what I eventually came to call real world college, where I would take sort of short jobs, short experiences that would, you know, pay the bills, but um, you would, I would probably only do once in my life. So that included building state park trails in the main wilderness, which was super fun. You basically lived outside for three months. Um, it involved being that security guard at the, the National Western Stock Show, which is in Denver. And so basically standing outside in the middle of the night um, in January in Denver, with a parking lot full of, you know, huge bulls who get out and you've got to corral them back to their, to their place. And I, I'm, I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to that. So 
<laughs> the the one lesson for that is, and this is a, this is sorry, this is the the law lo- even longer version uh, than I than I normally tell. But uh, the one lesson there, if you ever if you ever, a bull ever gets loose, if it has a ring on its nose and the there's a rope attached to it. Uh, don't, uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't give advice here. But anyway, this is what the, this is what the real, the real guys told me. They said, Hey, if you had a ring in your nose and a rope attached to it and someone pulled it, you would go wherever that goes. And so my, like my last day or second to last day, uh, I finally took one of the bulls that escaped back and tied it up. But normally I was like, all right, I'm making seven, seven dollars and 10 cents an hour here. I'm not getting, you know, trampled. So I would just call the the professionals in, but anyway, that's, that's a side side lesson. Uh, but anyway, uh, fast forward to that. I was doing a bunch of random things, but always knew I would come back to psychology. Um, and eventually I found my way to the Czech Republic and this was in 2010. And I lived, um, in this old farmhouse that this American expat had bought and needed someone to sort of take care of it. And I was 23, 24 and said, sure, I'll, I'm down for an adventure. So did that. And then when I came back, I started thinking about, okay, I've, done a bunch of random things. What, what do I want to, what do I want to do? What do I want to sink my teeth into? And while I was picking up some odd jobs here and there, uh, I said, you know, I, there's no place for me to read about really interesting, um, psychology work that's happening. Um, behavioral science was, wasn't much of a phrase at that point, I don't think, but I couldn't find anything. There were, there were kind of two versions. There was the extremely pop version um, and then there was the sort of science is really cool. Wow. Look at this brain scan, um, image stuff, which I, again, I thought was a little overhyped. It was interesting. I really wanted, how does behavior, how does human behavior and the sciences, social and behavioral sciences intersect with what's happening in the world or the questions we're asking about how we should live our lives, you know, philosophy or history. And that didn't exist. And then I, again, I saw all of these extremely smart people doing this research and they weren't maybe re- reaching an audience or their ideas weren't reaching as many people as they could having the impact that they could. So w- eventually in 2012, decided to start something called the psych report. And we did that for a few years, my brother and myself, my brother was a, a, a journalism, uh, he has a journalism background. So he's a journalist. And so I had the psychology background. Um, we roped in Barry Schwartz, he helped rope in some of his colleagues and we did what was the, the, the first iteration of behavioral scientist, which was having expert psychologists write about their research and, um, in digestible, interesting and engaging ways. And in 2016, it evolved as we teamed up with a couple of their projects that were happening. Um, it evolved into the behavioral scientist. And I'll pause there in case you have any questions that the pre that the I guess that's like almost the prehistory of it uh, leading up to 2016, and then we founded it in 2017. No, I, I love all of that. Thank you. And I think that for any of the audience that isn't familiar with the name of Barry Schwartz, like just roping in Barry Schwartz isn't a, a nothing of a of a name drop there. So um, linking to the episode on the paradox of choice, just for anyone who wants to uh, check that out, it is one of the actually most downloaded episodes of the podcast ever. So I haven't had Barry on the show or Angela yet. Right. But that's like uh, some cool people out there. So it's a big deal. I'm assuming we're talking about the same person when I. hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Okay. yeah, yeah. Barry, Barry's <laughs> great. Barry, Barry's great. I, um, he's such a, he's such a tremendous thinker, such a kind person. If people know about Barry's work and they're interested in maybe something that they haven't come across. I can give a couple of recommendations. When he retired from Swarthmore, I think in 2016, he gave a lecture, which you can find on the Swarthmore website. And it just encapsulates all his major ideas, but also how he lived his life as someone being really curious about, um, about behavior and studying it and being just a really kind thoughtful person. It's just a great example. And the, the, a lot of times you, you hear about the example of the, the people who, who aren't as kind and as thoughtful as Barry. And, and he, I, I like to say all roads lead to Barry because I would never really ask somebody something and they just say, Hey, have you talked to Barry about that yet? So, um, <laughs> so that's, that's one thing that talk. And then the other thing is his earlier books are really interesting. If you're, 
if you're interested in thinking about um, the world of behavioral science and social science before, I'd say the, the the behavioral economics revolution, so to speak, when the classical um, classical economics rational self interested man was still a dominant paradigm in a lot of places. Barry wrote a book called The Battle for Human Nature and the Cost of Living. Those are two different books. And they're really, really, really awesome books, terrific books. I just thinking how the way that we think about human behavior can influence the world that we design, basically. If you have, uh, and one of Barry's arguments, and he wrote, wrote about this in our recent print issue, Brain Meets World, is that if you have a certain conception of that human beings only work for pay, let's say, and then you design a workplace that only rewards pay and you forget about everything else, you're actually creating the environment. It's, your theory isn't correct, but you end up creating the behavior through your design of the environment. So really, really deep, interesting stuff that, that Barry worked on and stuff I've been thinking about since I was introduced to it, I guess, in 2008. So it's a decade and a half. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit of time, you know, that you've been thinking about <laughs> some of that. Well, we'll definitely link to those books and thank you for that. And I think everyone here can appreciate that. And I'm, you know, as we're having the conversation, you know, I end every episode of the podcast by saying to be thoughtful. It's my signature line. And this is the season where I always do episodes on um, the power of gratitude and giving first and reciprocity and, and happiness and all of that. So very, very well timed and, and suited. I like how things sort of uh, serendipitously work out that way. So we've now made it through the pre pre story. <laughs> so uh, let's keep keep going. Uh, sure. You know, it, yeah. Tell us more. OK, so in in. 2016, 2017, essentially, uh, Richard Thaler Center, CDR, um, was doing a, a, a blog related to his, his uh, book, Misbehaving, that came out. And Ideas42 was doing that. Um, BSPA, Behavioral Science and Policy Association, had, had a blog going on, and, and I was doing the psych report. And so those groups kind of came together and said, let's, let's combine our forces to create this public good, this publication that will will focus on expert commentary in the behavioral sciences, um, because there's there's no place for it right now. And so that was the seeds seed of it all. And um, we compiled a team from various groups of people with varying skill sets and varying interests and varying backgrounds, and started just got to work basically and. Uh, our goal has been to stay curious, to prioritize people who are, um, whether it be they're working in academia and government and nonprofit or in business, prioritize people who are asking really interesting and ambitious questions about human behavior and trying to answer them in, in rigorous and thoughtful ways. Um, and so that's kind of been our directive. Um, over the past five or so years, as we've brought together, I think, a really rich and diverse set of, of topics and approaches to thinking about human behavior. It's, it's, uh, I think it's over like 600 now articles or 650 with around 550 or 600 authors. So that's, that's pretty cool to think about only a small portion of those people may have gotten their ideas out. Um, had had something like behavioral scientists not existed, or had behavioral scientists not existed, uh, I don't know what they would have where they would have published. So it's really cool, and the feedback we're, we've been getting has been great. And um, yeah, really proud to be part of a team that that helped make that happen. Yeah, that's awesome. And I assume so. What sort of tips do you have for people that want to read more? Because I, as the editor in chief of this uh, space that has, like you said, 650 ish articles in the last six years, you know, seems like you must read a lot. Definitely. <laughs> um, so, is I, I'll, I'll just ask a clarifying question. Is your question how to just read generally about the field? Or if people want to go on behavioral scientists, where would I direct them? Ah, well, let's go with both. Why not? Okay. Well, for the first one, uh, I would say 
it's the, the first thought I have is it's really easy to get overwhelmed by just the sheer number of things that are being produced. And being overwhelmed can kind of sap your joy for something that you either are personally or professionally really excited about. And so I would say don't, the first thing about reading, I would say don't worry about trying to read everything. Um, that, that'd be like lesson number one. Um, and I guess the recommendation number two would be try and find your trusted sources, basically. Um, if there, I, I find this is what I do when I'm reading. If there's a, a journalist or an, uh, a scientist who's, who's writing who I really like, I will, and I see something by them again, I will, re, I will go back and read it again because I know that person, that person's approach. Um, is to provide thoughtful and interesting, engaging work in a sea of content where that's not always the case. I find that to be a, a useful heuristic. So don't, um, essentially it's, it's start collecting a little bullpen of people you really, you really kind of trust and want to listen to. And then I guess the, the other thing for reading is, and this applies, I think, to people in academia and people outside of and in business, which is don't be afraid of the, type of content you're not most used to. So if you're coming from business, maybe you're not used to reading an academic article. That doesn't mean you can't understand it. That doesn't mean you can't dig into it. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions about it. If it's something you're interested and curious about, dive right in, like roll up your sleeves and um, and go for it. Um, because chances are um, your questions are going to be good ones or you know your insights from it are going to be good ones. Um, and then likewise, I think for, for people in academia, it can be extremely useful to, uh, read things outside of, you know, the academic world because it can get into a little bit of a bubble. And so when you're bringing new ideas in, you know, we had a piece from, uh, Michael Hallsworth and Elspeth Kirkman about the intersection of literature and behavioral science. We had a piece from Ed Braden on science fiction and behavioral science. And so I think being open to other formats can be a really great way to, um, I think, read with an eye for human behavior. I, I personally, in my downtime, love reading fiction. I, I feel like authors are essentially studying human behavior all the time. And it's, it's a really great way f- for me to think about it and read about it, but in a, in a different context that I'm not doing in my day to day. Yeah. I'm always in awe of people that when you think about writing for whether it's like TV shows and movies and the character development and this understanding of how someone would act in a scenario that resonates with everyone who's watching or reading. I I always find that to be so fascinating and people that don't necessarily have the background in psychology say, but are just really good at understanding human behavior. I, I find to be such an interesting thing. And I, I bow down to anyone who can write really good fiction because I know that I don't think I would have the patience <laughs> for it. Yeah. I agreed. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful as well. And I agree that the, anytime you try and write something that you're not comfortable with, you immediately have, and this could be anything, you immediately have tons of respect for whoever does it professionally. Um, and maybe that's true of any profession, you know, as we're watching the world cup, uh, there are certainly people, if you go to a bar, why didn't they just pass? It? <laughs> and, you know, meanwhile, uh, as my friend said, we, we heard someone say something like that when we were watching and he's like, meanwhile, you know, that guy probably like slips on his way to the refrigerator, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. So, um, I, I think you immediately have respect, the respect for people when you write outside, um, of, of, or do something outside of your comfort zone. So that's definitely no different than writing. And, um, you appreciate taking, I think for, to come back to sort of writing a script or something to appreciate how that development happens over time and the mystery or the suspense you've got to build, um, alongside a sort of psychological reality that you're trying to construct and convey to the reader is really, really, really cool and really creative. And it's, it's, um, uh, yeah, I'd be really interested to talking to those, those folks and hear what they have to say about how they understand and observe human behavior. Cause it's probably something that a lot of behavioral scientists can learn from them. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I have someone to connect you to. Um, so I don't know if you've talked at all with, so it's a father son team that work with Robert Cialdini. So it's, and I just say Dave and Doug, and then I'm now 
off. I think that Dave is the son. Yeah, Dave Lundberg Kenrick. Have you talked to him yet? Uh-uh. <laughs> so his background, and he they were recently on the show talking about their book, uh, Solving Modern Problems with the Stone Age Mind. And Dave's background is in film and, and movies. And then his dad was the first graduate student of Bob Cialdini and then they still, he's still at ASU and then they have come to be working together over the years and talking about the, when they were first putting everything together from the book originally was looking at the psychology and how it gets applied of motivating factors of this evolved version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs into application in characters and movies and how that comes together. And then it became just overarching human behavior evolved out of movies. So I think that you would have an interesting um, conversation with him and I'd be happy to make that intro for you offline. Terrific. Yeah, that that sounds awesome. Uh, Really cool. Really cool. Thank you. Fun. All right. Good little side side chat there that always ends up being, um, you know, fun stuff in the podcast. And of course that, that episode and that book and everything, there are so many books that are going to be linked in this one. I usually try to (laughs) limit it to five and that's just not happening uh, (laughs) on this one. All right. Well, I'll see what I can do to not throw off your, your limit, but if more come to mind, I'll keep. keep No, no, no. We're it's (laughs) never, no, definitely. Uh, I do images in the show notes and to not have it be, you know, scrolling for eternity of books. I limit that to five. So we'll, we'll have lots of other links. Don't worry. (laughs) It's It's good to have that in there. So, I do have then one question before you get to the reading applied for when people are going to look and search in behavioral scientists. But one of the things that I have found that uh, people in academia specifically tend to struggle with is writing in a way that is engaging to people that aren't reading academic articles, because like you said, you get into the habit of writing for something specific. And so I think it's very interesting that you have so many people that are based in academia that then are writing, like you said, these more engaging um, and relatable articles for behavioral scientists. So is there a tip for those in academia who are looking to be better at writing in a more applied way, say if they want to do that on their LinkedIn or or whatever else to share their research, does your team help do some of that as like ghost writing for people that maybe that's not their strength, but their research is really interesting? You know, what's sort of the approach there? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, um, your first the first part of your question is, what advice do you have for for people who are in academia or in any sort of maybe specialized field. It could be business, it could be government, it could be nonprofit, whatever it is. Um, when you're going to write for a broad audience, what are some some good recommendations or good ways you approach that to make it engaging? And I'd say that the first thing is you've got to try and do it. That's like number one. You've got to take action, try and do it. Because academics, well, you can take that as an example. They are trained to write a certain way. It's not that they want to write in a way that makes, you know, um, people fall asleep. Um, it's not that <laughs> lawyers want to write necessarily write that way. It's that you're trained that way. It's that, you know, um, maybe the currency of the realm is to have an airtight argument rather than be more expansive. And a lot of times, maybe that's just what the format calls for if you're publishing in a, in a journal. And that can be the same for, for business. You know, um, if you're, if you're writing for your peers, um, in business or the, the people with the same specialty as you, you're going to approach it differently than if you're trying to engage someone in a topic. So the first thing you have to do is understand what your background is and what your strength is in writing and how you've been trained. So a little bit of like, what's most of the stuff I've been writing? And then the second thing is like, okay, well, who do I want to write for? And try and maybe compare an image of who you've been writing for or who you used to writing for with who you do want to write for. And I think that might start giving, giving, um, helping people imagine and giving you a sense of how you might need to change some of, some of what you're writing about. I think in the, in in the academic world, a lot of times they're having, you're having a very technical debate and you're can often get really caught up on methods, let's say, or really caught up on the nuances of something. But for somebody who's new to the topic or might apply the topic, they first have to, 
know? Why should I even care about this thing? What are the costs of me not knowing this? What are the opportunities if I do know it? What's a great example of, of this idea in, in the world? Um, is there a story that, that illustrates it? And so you've kind of got to almost go, it's, I'd say two, two layers above where a lot of your, I'd say professional discussions happen to start reaching a, a broad audience. You've got to, you've got to raise your perspective to almost more fundamental questions. That's not to say simple. Um, it's just to say that you've got to get someone invested. And a great way to do that is stories and examples and then costs and opportunities. Because immediately someone would see the value and see how it plays out. They can put themselves in that scenario. And if anyone's curious, we did a set of writing workshops that are open to the public this past summer. And we have, uh, there were three sessions. And so um, those those recordings are on YouTube. Another link. Woo. And uh, we had Lydie Klotz as one of our experts. He was talking about writing a book. We had Dave Nussbaum, who uh, runs... Uh, has been an editor for us and now runs a website, a service, I would say, called Psychgeist, and that's helping academics publish in popular outlets. And we also had Elizabeth Weingarten, who was our managing editor. Um, she also worked at Ideas42, and she's now at the the um, company Torch. And she actually just sold her book, which will be on question asking. Ooh. Yes, please. Yeah. So, so, um, I'm super excited for that, but it's a great, it's a great lineup of people. And, um, if so, if you're curious about writing, that's a great resource and uh, that I would send you to. Awesome. I will definitely link to that. I, I know that there are so many people that listen that think about writing books and, and even for any sort of content, you know, so we're in a content world now. <laughs> and if, all whatever it is that you're doing, you want you need to be able to create and speak to people in a way that they want to listen, right? And if that's written or in video or whatever it is, being able to uh, approach that in a way that makes it so it's less intimidating and you're able to get through and and really have a clear message, I think is so important. One of the other tips I always give to people on this too is whatever you think you need to say or cover in a particular piece of content, let's call it a blog post or an article for this space, you are trying to include too much in it. I can almost guarantee whatever you think you need to put into the article is way more than what you need. And stuff that's most engaging is the like tiniest little sliver of what your knowledge base is and then really expanding and going deep on that one thing. And then you actually have probably, you know, 15 articles from the one thing that you thought you needed to write. And it will resonate much more when you can stretch it out into those thoughts. I think that's common advice that we give that um, the more focused you can be, um, the better. And some, some language that we use are, you know, what's when you're trying to put in all your ideas into a piece because you've got a, a lot of stuff that you want to say, who's going to be the leading actor in this in this piece and who are the supporting actors? Doesn't mean they're not relegated, they're not necessarily off stage, but who are the supporting actors that come in later that complement the the lead actor? And that um that's a way that to do exactly what you said, I think have a more of an impact by doing a little bit less, subtracting. Indeed. All roads all roads are starting to lead to Lighty Klotz. I know. <laughs> we'll we'll definitely have to let him know that uh he'll have to listen to this one. That's fun. Uh okay, so thank you for taking that detour with me as we're, you know, making our journey through behavioral science here. So for someone who, like you were saying, the other way that you interpreted my question before was approaching reading in behavioral scientist itself. So what recommendations do you have there? Yeah. So I'd say the first thing I would recommend is sign up for the weekly newsletter and see if it's for you. Um, our goal with the weekly newsletter is to provide, we, our, our, again, our emphasis is expert commentary. And so our goal is to provide a, a really wide range of experts who are writing opinion articles or analysis articles or essays that are bringing their expertise and connecting it to current events or kind of evergreen questions that we have about human nature. And so 
you should hopefully encounter things that you wouldn't necessarily seek out, but then would affect your thinking. Our articles, when we're really thinking of our audience, we like a good piece of literature. Um, a, another writer can read a good piece of literature. A student can read a good piece of literature. Um, a writing instructor could read it. A, uh, a professional, a manager, you know, so many people can read a good piece of literature that and get something from it that's unique to their situation. And so that's kind of a little bit of what we try and do with ours is if you click on an article and you read it, the idea is that um, it may not be something you thought you were going to read. It may not be directly relevant all the time to exactly what you're doing, but you're going to learn something and it's going to be by one of the leading experts in that thing. Um, and so we think it provides a, a lot of value in that way. So that's the newsletter. And then um, we, um, of course, like any website, we've got topic areas and field areas, which you can certainly peruse. We've got our contributors, which you can sort by their domain. Um, and so if you're interested in a particular um, area, you could, you could do that. And of course, the search function is a great way too. I'd say the other thing that we do that, that may be interesting to folks is we have a, a reading section. Um, so this is when we're curating stuff from around the web. That's a great way to also find things you might out of the ways find. And, um, and we, we put out something monthly that we call the research lead and we pick new research, um, from academia and applied settings and research. I'm using research, uh, very broadly here. Um, uh, the core is that, but it's not only that guides and things like that, that we find interesting are also there. Um, and we do about eight, eight, picks a month. And that's really wide variety. I mean, we just published one for November and it's everything from a team did a, a study on who's cheating at Wordle, um, which was kind of a fun entry. I saw that. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to read it yet, but I, I saw that and, and bookmarked it to go back. If and... you know anyone in Vermont, maybe don't trust them. Uh -oh. uh, I mean, that, Vermont yeah. is where the... <laughs> <laughs> apparently they're Google they're, they're googling what the answers are apparently um according uh -oh. to this research so um I guess we've now offended we've now maybe offended the Dutch listeners and the Vermont listeners but sorry Vermont my cousins live in Vermont so maybe they're driving that effect I haven't played wordle with them yet <laughs> and so yeah so uh, I would say there's a lot of great ways to to dive into the work and and another thing that people have told us they find it useful for is when if you have some work that you're doing or you're familiar with behavioral science, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners are, and you're connecting with someone about it who's maybe newer, there might be a topic or a topic area that they care about it professionally or a topic area they care about personally. And we might have an article on it written by, again, one of the, the leading thinkers on the topic that might be a great bridge to connect with them on it. So we find that a lot of people who are uh, in the field are using behavioral science as a tool to, to make these connections. Um, so that's a sort of reading, reading plus, I guess, reading and sharing. Awesome. Well, and for everyone, it is uh, as you go now to behavioralscientist.org, and there will be, of course, a link among the many links in the show notes for you. Uh, but it's really easily laid out here. So, you know, topics they have, the topics list is business, culture, education, environment, government, health, history, law, science, society, and technology. And then you can also search uh, search by different fields. So behavioral design, behavioral economics, education, marketing, neuroscience, political science, psychology, sociology, and some others. Uh, some really cool things here, cartoons and ask a behavioral scientist. And uh, like you're saying, what we're reading and special issues. And, and of course, being able to get and buy uh, people's print copies of Brain Meets World. So before, as we close out here, and as people are going to go find so much more about you, what's the best way to connect? What is Brain Meets World? What are the next steps? What's next for a behavioral scientist? I'm so Big glad you question. asked. Brain Me <laughs> yes, Brain Meets World was um, is a is a thematic print issue that we did. That was um, essentially it was tracing the journey that we have in this. Uh, when you have an idea, you know, I imagine you know, kind of waking up and you've got this amazing idea. Now everything fits together. That problem you were you couldn't solve when you when you left work the night before. Now it all fits. 
and you go to write it down and you you hit a snag or you think you got it and then you go to test it and you hit a snag, but then you keep going. And so Brainbeats World was really what happens to our ideas when we uh, they start out as an idea and we bring them out into the world. Like what's the journey that they go on? So it's it's a little bit of a hero's uh, um, the hero's journey um, for for those who know that, that sort of narrative style. It's every fairy tale or you know Disney. Disney uh, hero probably follows that arc. But what we did is we tried to explore that in the world of behavioral science. And it's it's really interesting because when a behavioral scientist um, is exploring an idea about humans, it's it becomes very meta. And you're now starting to think about um, meta in a good way, I would say. It's this really unique scenario where, and it's, and it's such an essentially human scenario where we are extremely smart, creative, and interesting creatures. We're also just extremely like error prone. We're, we make mistakes. We can be, uh, you know, uh, quirky. We can be, um, a klutz. All of these things kind of come out. And I think that's perfectly mashed up when people, people try and study people. And so Brain Meets World features seven chapters that follow that arc and they feature, uh, Again, long form articles, long form interviews um, about the craft of behavioral science. Really, we were going for trying to convey our love for falling in love with asking questions about human behavior and being curious about human behavior, almost as a posture towards uh, towards life, especially our work, of course, but also towards life. When you chase the answer all the time, although we, we certainly want answers. It never feels satisfying. What is satisfying is continuously asking the questions. And so that was kind of the spirit of what we did. And a lot of great contributors um, from Lisa Feldman Barrett to Rory Sutherland to uh, an interview with Betsy Palak. Um, I got to do a really fun story on Chiara Verrazzani, who's the chief behavioral scientist at OECD, and her husband, uh, Tomas Andrelon, who... Uh, is a neuroscientist in Paris, and they went on this long road trip, crazy adventure, and which changed his work in the end. And so it was a really fun project. And if people are interested in it, uh, we ship anywhere in the world. The print copy, it was, we had a great designer on our team, Liam, um, do the art. And it's a really high quality product that we just were really happy to do. And it's, it's kind of like one of those things that, uh, you know, people ask us why we were doing it. And I hope when you receive it and you read it and you hopefully feel like this isn't something you've ever picked up before that you, you know, and I get, so like, that's my, that's my prompt. So if you're curious about human behavior, it's certainly for you. I love it. And everyone listening is definitely curious about human behavior. We're all about asking great questions and not jumping into solving problems, but to, uh, you know, be more thoughtful about them. And I have my copy of Brain Meets World. I recommend everybody go check that out. And of course, as with everything, there will be links in the show notes into behavioral scientists. And again, Evan, thank you so much for joining me. It was so fun to chat with you. And I look forward to the next time because I'm sure we have many, many more uh, connections on the uh, you know road leaving to every road that leads to Lighty, right? As we go. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> terrific. Th- thanks so much for having me. It was really fun to, to share a little bit about the history of behavioral scientists share about what we're doing. And um, if any of your listeners have questions for me, feel free to connect them to me. Perfect. We'll definitely do so. So thanks again. And uh, yeah, off to behavioral science land, I guess. (laughs) Yes. Thank you again to Evan Nesterak for joining me on the show today. What got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? For me, I always love hearing the story behind the story. And this was such a fun mix of amazing people that Evan has worked with over the years. I am very jealous. And it's turned into this amazing magazine that's helping to spread the word to the world about great things in behavioral science. Fantastic. This, of course, includes the article from Michael Hallsworth called Do Nudges Work, which inspired a very popular interview I did with him a couple months ago on the same topic. That episode of The Brainy Business is, of course, linked for you in the show notes. 
They also have great book lists and fun articles like we talked a little bit about today about, you know, Wordle and (laughs) all sorts of really fascinating things. And it's also useful and a fun place to learn and get inspired and see who's who in the world of behavioral science. As we close out this episode, don't forget about those show notes, which include links to all the related past episodes and books, including Brain Meets World and ways to connect with Evan and check out Behavioral Scientist and so much more. You'll be glad you did. It's all waiting for you in the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 245. And thank you again to Evan Nesterak for joining me on the show today. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Join me Tuesday for another Brainy episode of the Brainy Business Podcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.